Tired of the everyday routine? Ever dream of a life of romantic adventure? Want to get away from it all? We, we offer you... Escape! Escape! Designed to free you from the four walls of today for a half hour of high adventure. Tonight we escape to an early California gold camp and an exciting tale of frontier revenge as Les Crutchfield tells it in his colorful story, The Pistol. San Francisco Bay was a graveyard that summer. With over 300 deserted windjammers lying at anchor, and the city itself the next step to a ghost town. Every man who could walk, run, or stagger had headed inland to look for gold, and the women had followed. Mostly they traveled up the river as far as Sacramento, then fanned out into the hills. That was the jumping off place, Sacramento. Boys, move up close. Everybody sees and everybody gets a chance. Anytime old Honest Faraday runs an auction, you know it's on the level. All right now, friends. The pistol I'm holding in my hand here is the first one of its kind ever seen west of the Rockies. The first model of Dr. Samuel Coates' new 44 caliber six-shooter. The gun that fires six times without reloading. Now, who'll open her up with a bit of $250? Did you hear me? $250. Come on, boys. There's plenty of gold on the Sacramento River, but only one Colt six-shooter. Now, did I hear a bit of, say... $250. Thank you, sir. The man says $250. All right, here we I go. I stood there in the hot sun on the Sacramento waterfront and watched the crowd bidding for the pistol. Roustabouts, gamblers, vaqueros, gold miners, men from everywhere and from nowhere. And a few women. I wanted that gun myself. I wanted it bad. I was taking a stagecoach to Rawhide Flats in the morning where my brother Dave and his partner had located a rich claim. And I didn't plan to load myself down with an outfit. But a gun was different. I was packing $1,000 in gold eagles, and I was ready to lay out a good part of it to get that six-shooter. The bidding reached $500. All right, anybody else, anybody making 550 Five and a quarter, five and a quarter, anybody else? All right, going once, going twice. $600. $600, and a new bidder. I have $600. Gentlemen here bid $600. Will anybody make it six and a quarter? Six and a quarter, only six. $700. $700, and another new bidder. And the little lady knows a bargain when she sees one. All right, I'm bid $700, 777 seven, seven. Will anybody make an eight? How about you, mister? Follow the bid six. Would you want to raise it again, sir? Sorry, mister. Six was my limit. Let her have it. All right, anybody else? Going once, going twice. So, lady, you bought yourself a gun. Thank now, you. friends, if you'll step Pardon right me, over please. here to the end of the platform, I've got Can I get through? Here, Pardon me, please. Well, right. congratulations. What? Oh, you should have kept on bidding. Why? You'd have gone to $1,000 if you had to. Yes, I suppose I would. I guess it just isn't your lucky day. Oh, I don't know. Haven't I just met the prettiest girl in California? Have you? Haven't I? Maybe that's not as lucky as you think. <laughs> When I climbed on board the stagecoach to Rawhide Flats the next morning, I found seven trunks had already been loaded, five tied on the back and top and two inside. And a few minutes later, their owner showed up. Oh, it was the red-headed gal who'd bought the gun the afternoon before. It took five miles out of Sacramento to break the ice. And after that, well, I learned her name was Teresa Blake. She'd been down to San Francisco to buy some new clothes. And she was on her way back to Rawhide Flats. No. No, I don't live with my folks. I don't have any folks. I, I work. Oh? Doing what? I'm a singer. The Brass Nugget Saloon. I see. No wonder you wanted a gun so bad. No, I never have any trouble there. I got the pistol as a present for my boss, Mr. Mallory. $700 makes a pretty expensive present, Miss Blake. He's been good to me. Awfully good. I see. Well, anyway, it's a great gun. <laughs> In 15 years, every man west of St. Louis will be packing one. Oh, I was going to give you something. I almost forgot. 
A sort of consolation prize for losing out on the gun. Uh, oh, here it is. Yeah, it looks like a little gold nugget. Brass, not gold. Just a hang on a watch chain. Souvenir of the Brass Nugget Saloon. Of course, you can pretend it's real gold if you like. All right, I will then. <laughs> I hope that's not what my young brother's doing on the Boston Pocket Claim of his. I mean, pretending it's real. The Boston Pocket Claim? Uh-huh. You said your name was Storm. That's right. Jonathan Storm. I didn't even recognize it until... Then you're Dave Storm's brother. Yeah. Do you know him? Yes. Yes, I... Mr. Storm, I wonder if you'd mind if I tried to get some sleep now. I'm... I'm really awfully tired. Around the middle of the afternoon, our stagecoach dropped out of the rough hills we've been traveling through. Ran down into a comparatively level gulf, splashed across the ford in the creek below town, and swung into the wagon-rutted main street of Rawhide Flats. It was like every other boom town I'd seen. A mixture of mud, shacks, board-fronted stores, bars, room and houses, stables, horses, burrows, and men. Men everywhere milling and shoving along the plank walks and out into the street. Noisy, brawling, bearded, and tough. Rawhide flats. Half hour later, I rented a horse and rode up through the canyon north of town. Both banks of the creek were lined with miners busy with picks and shovels, pans and rockers. All of them breaking their backs. Sweating out their hearts for the same reason. Gold. About three miles up, I turned into the side canyon the man at the livery stable had told me about. And a few yards in, I found it blocked off by a six-foot rail fence. All right, mister. That's far enough. Yeah? Afraid I might jump that fence? Don't get smart. Just turn that horse around and head out the same way you came in. Why? I just got here. Is this the Boston pocket claim? That's right. You're as close to it right now as you're going to be. Go on, get... Now, look, suppose you put that rifle away before it goes off and hurts somebody, huh? And go tell the owner his brother's here. Barton Mallory's got no brother. Now, get out. Mallory? The way I heard it, Dave Storm is the owner of this claim. Storm? Are you Storm's brother? That's right. Is he around here? Get out of here, Storm. Boot that horse and ride, do you hear me? He's the last one you're gonna get. So start riding. All right, mister. I never argue with anybody who's packing a rifle, unless I've got one, too. And maybe the next time I will have. Come on, boy, get up! Yes? Oh, Mr. Storm, what are you doing here? How did you find my room? I asked one of the bartenders over at the Brass Nugget. Mind if I come in, Miss Blake? Of course I mind. Why, if Bart... If Mr. Mallory found you here, he'd... He'd what? You only work for him. He doesn't own you, does he? That's no concern of yours. You're presuming a good deal simply because we rode in the same stagecoach. Now, get out. Uh, Miss Blake, I didn't come here with any presumption in mind. All I'm after is some information about my brother Dave. Where is he? I don't know anything about him. You brought his name up yourself during the trip this morning. I have nothing to say. Will you please leave? What's this about Bart Mallory owning Dave's Boston Pocket claim? I know nothing about it. Dave's partner's called Dan Rivers. Do you know him? Get out. All right, Miss Blake. I'll find him. And it's nice to have seen you again. Look, if you want some good advice... Leave town right now and don't ask any more questions. Why not? Never mind why not, Mr. Storm. Just get out of town fast. Thanks for the advice, Miss Blake. I'll decide whether it's good or not after I talk to my brother and his partner. Now look, Dan, you're Dave's partner, so let's have it straight. Why does everybody shut up like a clam when I mention his name? What's this all about? Where's Dave, anyway? Jonathan, I... I wish somebody else had told you. Told me what? That David is dead. Dead? That's right, Jonathan. He was... He was... Go on, Dan. What happened? He was shot in the back. 
We found him lying in the street in the north edge of town one morning a couple of weeks ago. I see. Who did it? You want the official story? Yeah, first. Uh, they say Dave dropped into the Brass Nugget Saloon late that night and sold the Boston pocket claim to Bart Mallory. Took $12,000 in gold certificates for it. And they say that's how come he was murdered and robbed after he left the Nugget. Has Mallory got a deed, a bill of sale? Yeah, he's got one all right with Dave's name on it. How come Dave could sell the claim out from under you even if he wanted to? I thought the two of you were partners. We were, but we recorded the whole claim in Dave's name. And that way, only one of us had to make the trip to Sacramento. All right, all right. That's the official story. Let's have the other one. Dave wouldn't have sold out to Mallory for any amount of money. Mallory had been after him for weeks, but Dave and me both knew we had the best claim in Rawhide Flat. So? Some of his gunslingers bushwhacked Dave. Mallory turned up with his phony deed the next day. And everybody in town knows it, but nobody dares to say so. Hmm. I suppose it's like every other boom camp. No law here yet, huh? Only what law a man can make for himself. In that case, I guess I better make a little. To fit this Bart Mallory. Uh, maybe you don't know exactly what you're tying into, son. Why, he's got half a dozen or more of the toughest boys in California on his payroll. We'll find out how tough they are. Don't count much on me. I, I'm an old man. All right, Dan. So they're not the best odds in the world. Can't be helped. You play with the cards you got. Dave used to tell me you were the coldest man he ever seen when it come to trouble. I think maybe he was right. Well, first thing I need is a gun. With odds the way they are, I guess I better have a six-shooter. With you out of luck, Jonathan. I've heard of him, but you won't find one here in Rawhide. Oh, there's one here, all right. Fella got it just today. Fella named Mallory. Mallory? Now, now wait a minute, Now, look, son. Dan. I taught a lot of my brother. And I don't like the way he was killed. I need that gun of Mallory's. I'm going to get it. And then I'm going to use it to get Mallory. That's the way it's going to be, Dan. You can count on it. In just a moment, we will return you to the second act of Escape. But first, another Wednesday night, Star Night, coming up on CBS again tomorrow. The young fellow who made good on the Bing Crosby show last week will be back again for more songs and fun-making. The young fellow named Al Jolson, who Bing thinks is quite promising. Burns and Allen will be around again with more of their madcap humor, and Groucho Marx will be throwing the ad libs fast and furiously on You Bet Your Life. And Dr. Christian, the only show in radio where the audience writes the scripts, will be announcing a great new prize contest. They're all heard on most of these same CBS stations. So tune in tomorrow night for Dr. Christian, Groucho Marx, Bing Crosby, and Burns and Allen. And now we return you to... Escape. I stepped inside the swinging doors of the Brass Nugget Saloon and looked things over. Finally, I had the bartender point out Mallory... He was sitting at a table in the back near the offices, playing poker with three other men. The two boys lounging against the wall behind him were obviously his bodyguards. I pushed my hat back on my head and walked toward the table. Well, there you are, boys. Four tens. I guess that ought to do it. Sorry to butt in, but uh, is your name Barton Mallory? Yeah, that's right. Something I can do for you? My name is Storm. Jonathan Storm. This is the one I told you about, boss. Oh. You probably knew my brother. Oh, yes, David Storm. Sure, he used to come in here. So I heard. You got anything special in your mind? Yeah. You... I need a gun. I understand you got a new six-shooter. I'm sorry, it's not for sale. I didn't say anything about buying it. I'll bet $1,000 against that gun on a cut for high card. What do you say? Sorry, Storm, the gun's out of it. Name something else. No, I want the gun. What's the matter, Mallory? The boys told me you'd bet on anything in the house if the odds were right. Yeah, that's right, I will. But the gun's a gift from a friend. Maybe you figure your luck's about to run out. Would that be it? 
All right, I'll take the bet. Benny, break out a new deck. Yeah. Well, there's the gun. Let's see your thousand. Sure. Mind if I shuffle? No, no, no. Go ahead. Uh, maybe I should have warned you, Mallory. I got a feeling this is my lucky night. I'll take a chance it isn't. Mm. By the way, you wouldn't happen to have any idea who shot my brother in the back, would you, Mallory? No, I'm afraid not. The killer hasn't been identified yet. That's too bad. Maybe I'll have to identify him myself. You're cut, Mallory. All right. Ten of clubs, huh? Go ahead, Storm. Jack of diamonds. Thanks for the gun. Oh, it's already loaded, too. Well, I think I'll be... Hi, I've been looking all over the place, and I can't find... Oh, uh... Good evening, Miss Blake. How do you do, Mr. Storm? I'm sorry if I'm interrupting. No, no, no. I'm glad you came. Gives me an idea. Mallory... How'd you like another chance at my thousand dollars? What's your bet? High card again. Thousand dollars against a kiss from Miss Blake. What? Of course, maybe you don't have any say over it, huh? Wait a minute, the, the bet's on. You want to shuffle again? No, no, no. Go ahead, cut. Queen of Spades, you'll find that pretty hard to beat. Yeah, I guess you're right. Ace of Hearts does it, though. <laughs> my lucky night, Mallory. Well, Miss Blake, I guess you're... Don't you dare. I'm afraid you don't have much choice about it, honey. I won this from your boss. You... You... (laughs) 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 It's too bad, Storm. Looks as if the lady doesn't like your brand. No, I guess not. I didn't expect her to be the one to have to tell me, though, Mallory. I kind of thought that you might resent that, might want to do something about it. Why? That's what she's here for. It's her job. She gets paid to take care of the customers. Why should I worry about a cheap little... What's your talk? Hold it, boys. You're covered. All right, Mallory. You better get up off the floor and call off those dogs of yours. If either one moves, I'll kill him. All right. All right, all right, boys. You can drop it. Storm, it was a pretty bad mistake you just made. I don't forget things. I think maybe this was your last lucky night. I'll make that a bet if you want. All right, boys, come on, let's go. Mallory and his gunman went into the office and didn't come back. Finally, after about an hour, I walked out of the brass nugget and bumped square into a middle-aged woman who'd been waiting for me just outside. She said Teresa wanted to see me right away in her room. Put that gun away, Mr. Storm. I'm here alone. This isn't a trap. And what is it? I want to know why you made that bet. I mean, about kissing me. Suppose we just say I wanted to. Let it go at that. You're afraid, aren't you? You're afraid not to be tough. Is that why you asked me to come here to tell me that? Well, don't you suppose a girl can... can have feeling left... But you can be sorry for things. Meet somebody, maybe. Go ahead, honey. You're doing fine. What do you mean? I mean I'm halfway ready to believe that. A little more of it, and I would believe it. And if I had any sense, I'd know better. I see. And that's the way you feel about it. It's a start, isn't it? This is the first time I have... Oh, it's a you. Try you it wouldn't and find believe. out. Get out. You don't understand anything. Go on. Get out. Get out. Get out. I'm telling you, son, it's the worst mistake you could have made. Knocking him down like you did last night, why, he won't think of nothing else. Not until he's killed you. People have tried that before, Dan. I'm still here. But you haven't got a chance. His gun will be watching like hawks for the first second you're not covered. The whole town isn't on Mallory's payroll. I've got an idea. A lot of people around here might like to see him shown up. Provided somebody else called the play. Eh, maybe so, but still leaves half a dozen of his gunslingers to deal with. I don't think so, Dan. If their boss is knocked over, they'll drift. I've seen hired guns before. Odds are against you, son. Well, I feel lucky. 
It's worth a chance to get Mallory. Not only for killing Dave, but because of what he's doing to Teresa Blake. Teresa Blake? Yeah, I kind of think she'd be a pretty decent kid if it weren't for him. Yes, Jonathan. That's what your brother Dave thought. What? He was crazy about her, too. Hung around the brass nugget every night. She kept leading him on. I guess that fitted in with Mallory's plans. Yeah. I guess it did. I guess it still does. What do you mean, son? Nothing, Dan, when you come right down to it. I guess when a... When a man turns soft, it always starts with his head. Uh, I'm sorry, Jonathan. I... I didn't know you felt that way about it. Oh, it's all right. I'm glad you told me. Glad I found out in time. And now that I have, I think I can use Miss Blake. Why did you come here? What do you want? A short talk, honey. I don't want Mallory to see us. You've got to leave town. Leave now and don't come back, please. How much do you get for this, honey? I mean talking me into leaving town and getting me out of Mallory's way. You fool. Oh, you fool. He doesn't mean a thing to me. It's you, don't you know that? I'll go with you if you'll only leave tonight. I'll go with you right now, please. No. I've gone too far now to turn back. I've got to finish it up. It's not too far yet, but it will be. Maybe you'll want to turn back then, only it'll be too late. A few hours from now, it'll all be done. And then maybe we can think about some other things. If you still want to. Want to? Of course I'll want to, Johnny. Johnny. Nobody's called me that for a long time. Terry, I want you to do something for me. Anything, Johnny, anything. Do you think you can get that deed to my brother's claim from Mallory's strong box and give it to me? I think so. Yes, of course I can. He trusts me enough. Yeah, I'll bet he does. How long will it take? Give me an hour. All right. Johnny, w- would... Won't you kiss me first? Sure, Terry. Oh, Johnny. That was better than the one I... I risked a thousand dollars for. Nobody could buy that for a thousand dollars. Nobody ever has. Come back here to my room in an hour, Johnny. I'll have the deed. I followed her into town, staying behind her in the darkness. And from the opposite side of the street, I watched her walk into the swinging doors of the brass nugget. Then I... I slipped into the shadows between two top paper shacks and waited. It was a half hour before they came out of the saloon and headed down the street toward Teresa Blake's room and house. All six of Mallory's gunslingers. He wasn't taking any chances. Terry had double-crossed me after all. Just the same as she double-crossed my brother. And that was fine with me because I was ready for it. I walked into the brass nugget and down the hallway at the far end of the bar. I eased the six-shooter into my hand and stopped in front of the door to Mallory's office. Come in. Evening, Mallory. Stop. I th- well, it was quite a surprise. Yeah, I imagine. Keep your hands on the desk. Well, sure, sure, Storm. I, I don't have a gun anyway. Watch him, Johnny. He's lying. He carries one in his sleeve. You dirty little rat. Well, I didn't see you there in the corner, Miss Blake. Thought you might be down the street waiting to watch the fireworks. They made me tell, Johnny. One of the boys followed me and saw us together. When I came back here, they made me tell. They hit me. Look. That must be real painful. Almost as bad as being shot in the back like Dave was. I didn't know what they were planning. I didn't know Bart was going to kill him. Johnny, I swear I didn't. Drop it. Mallory, you got a forged bill of sale there in your strong box. I want it. Sorry, Storm, you're out of luck. I won't open the box and you can't. What makes you figure you're in a position to argue about it? Why not? Because you've got a gun on me? You wouldn't shoot an unarmed man, Storm. What about that gun in your sleeve? I'm not drawing it. I see. All right, Miss Blake, get out of here. Johnny, what are you... I said get out. 
And don't bother going after the boys. There won't be time. Johnny! Get out! So you won't draw Mallory, huh? You're going to play it safe. Oh, I'd be crazy to do anything else. Maybe. The only way out of this room is through the door behind me. I noticed that kerosene lamp has a glass bowl on it. Ought to start a nice fire if I picked it up and smashed it against the wall. Storm! Storm, you fool! What about it, Mallory? My gun's in the holster. Want to stay there and burn or draw and try to get out? This place will go up like a tinderbox. Take your choice, Mallory. Draw or burn. Storm! Storm, you can't leave me in here like this. Draw or burn. All right, then, if you... Tough luck, Mallory. That's for Dave. And that's for me. All right, hold it a second, hold it! You better clear out of here fast. The place is on fire. And anybody that works for Bart Mallory is out of a job. He's dead. Jonathan, sir, are you all right? You're not hurt? No, I'm all right, Dan. Come on, let's get out of here. Sure, come on, son. Mallory's dead. I guess that takes care of it, Dan. Uh, Jonathan, you're the luckiest man alive. Yeah, sure. Somebody might go down to Jackson's rooming house. Tell those bushwhackers of Mallory's I can hit the trail north. The boss is dead. The boss is dead. This ought to be far enough, Dan. Look. Look, the fire's breaking through to the roof. Won't be long now. Johnny. Johnny. Johnny, are you all right? Sure I'm all right. What of it, Miss Blake? Thank heaven. Oh, Johnny, if anything had happened to you, I couldn't have gone on. Miss Blake, I... I've got something for you. It's a nugget. Some people might figure it's real gold. But actually, it's only brass. There you are. Pick it up. And then get going. What? What do you mean, Johnny? I mean you better catch up with the boys. They'll be heading north. But, but you said that we... Drop it. Oh, yes. Here's something else you can have, too. Your six shooter? No, no, no. It's yours. You bought and paid for it. It's got one shot left. Use it any way you want to. Only get out. Beat it. Johnny, you're wrong, you know. You're wrong about a lot of things. But what's the use? That's right. What's the use? Bye, Johnny. Son, you had not to give her that pistol. That was your luck, you might call it. I think my luck's all run out, Dan. Yeah. Claim is all yours. I'm leaving in the morning, heading south. Why, son, there's nothing south of here. Yeah. But it's the surest way I know to keep myself from heading north. Escape is produced and directed by William N. Robeson. Tonight we have presented The Pistol by Les Crutchfield. Featured in the cast were Gerald Moore as Jonathan Storm, Betty Lou Gerson as Terry Blake, Charlie McGraw as Bart Mallory, and Will Gear as Dan Rivers. Also heard was Eddie Marr. Special music was arranged and conducted by Del Castillo. Next week. You are in command of an English destroyer sailing to join the North Sea Patrol in October 1914. It is midnight. And from the enemy coast comes a desperate signal for help, which you would like to ignore, but from which there is no escape. Next week, we escape with Robert Buckner's exciting and unforgettable tale, The Man Who Won the War. Goodbye, then, until this same time next week, when once again we offer you Escape. <laughs> This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.